Hello, welcome to episode 68 of the Stanford MLC seminar series. Uh, today, I am glad to be with Su. So say hi. Hi. <laughs> uh, Michael. Hello. And Curran, who's hey. back from, uh, from India and uh, his, his exciting adventures. So a little bit about today's podcast. Uh, it's, um, hello to everybody in CS324 again. We're glad to have you here. Glad to have you watching. Uh, today, we, we have our great guest, Su. So Su is a professor at uh, ETH. Um, before that, he was a, a student with Chris Ray, um, who, who's, you know, our, our advisor. Uh, today, So is going to be talking about some really crazy ideas about how to do decentralized learning in machines scattered across the whole world. If you think about how slow your internet is, um, imagine training a deep network over, over those network speeds. And So is going to be talking about uh, uh, a lot of those things. Um, so So is a professor at ETH. He's also the co-founder and I believe the CTO of Together Compute. Um, so he's got a lot of experience in the field and and in research doing these things. So we're very excited to have Su. Um, and so take it away. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for the invitation. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about our research in general and also specifically on how we optimize essentially communication for distributed and uh, disinterest learning. So I think everyone here just witnessed this great progress of machine learning and AI in the, in the last decade, right? So just last year, we see this amazing model can actually turn text into a hyper-realistic image like this. We all saw this open uh, like open AI GPT, uh, like ChatGPT demo can generate kind of really amazing text. And all those progress is something you can actually measure quantitatively over the years. If you look at the image net score over the last like 10 years, we literally get more than 20 points improvement over the last decade. And the same thing also apply for NLP, right? If you look at what happened in the last six years, I mean, I mean, we see, for example, in, in squad, there's like more than 20 points improvement on the accuracy. And because of all those amazing uh, like, uh, like progress of AI and machine learning, we start to see those models come into every single corner of our life, from small things like sensor network to bigger things like smart cars, smart city, and so on and so forth. So there are so many things that actually enable such a progress. Uh, but among them, I would argue there are two driving forces that have been moving this forward. And they are about the data and also about the compute. So this is uh, one uh, like, like figure from an open AI paper like two years ago, right? As you can see on the left-hand side, the more data you start to push into the system, you start to get this consistent improvement of the model quality. But of course, the more data you put in, the more compute that you are going to require. But all those compute, you are not burning them for nothing, right? So every single floating point operation that you are doing actually translates to a pretty consistent improvement of the model quality. And because of this, it's not surprising that we are pushing bigger and bigger data sets into our model. Just like 10 years ago, if you look at ImageNet, and we have 1.3 million images. And today, if you look at those like vision model, it's not uncommon for us to push billions of weekly label images into the training of those models. And of course, the computation side also start to explode. If you want to do a GPT-3 175 billion model, right? you are talking about thousands of GPU training nonstop maybe for a month. And that even doesn't give you the most expensive model that you can train today. And we see this very interesting interconnection between data and compute and model quality. But among all of those amazing progress, there are also challenges that we are facing today. So the first challenge, is that even though we know how to build a model at today's scale, actually building them can be very, very expensive. And the costs actually come from essentially two different perspectives. You have the cost about acquiring the data, cleaning the data, right, and filtering all the data into a high quality core. And you also have the cost that you spend on computation. And today, for both of these two things, data and compute, you can easily reach a million dollar routine for today's model. And the second challenge that we are facing today, which may be even, like, even more fundamental than the cost, is that if you want to scale the model by another 10 times, I believe that we are actually reaching this nonlinear bottleneck. That is, if you keep doing what we are doing today, that's throwing away, like, like, like throwing in like 10 times more money, probably will not give you 10 times more scaling. So we have to change how we think about data and also how we think about compute. So if you look at these two challenges, uh, our belief is that they are actually the consequence of two fundamental bottlenecks. The first bottleneck is about communication. 
because training anything at scale today is very communication intensive. Uh, just uh, give you some numbers, right? If you want to do a six billion parameter model uh, in a GPT-3 style, right? 300 billion tokens, uh, 2 million size, right? So if you have the machine has been 100 hours just for the computation, we are talking about you are going to spend almost 1,000 hours just to communicate the data for a workload that the computation is only almost like 200 hours. And the whole thing is going to get worse when you are training even bigger models. And the consequence of this is that if you look at the model training today, they are actually largely restricted to centralized data centers with very fast network connections. And the consequence of that is that it's kind of relatively hard to use cheaper alternatives. For example, those machines in tier two to tier four cloud, spot instance, volunteer computes, even those computations that are there and are usually cheaper, it's very hard to actually use them because they are not connected by the network that's actually fast enough. And if you look further into the future, if you like, so I would argue even in the data center environment, that could cause problems because if you want to scale the whole thing by another 10 times, you need to build this equally fast interconnections between like 10 times more machines, right? Even for data center, that could cause a problem. And the second bottleneck is actually caused uh, by the data because when the data set become larger and larger, almost inevitably, you will see the quality start to decrease. So this is just one example about what you can query uh, in the Lang 5B data set with 5 billion images. If you query doctor, right? So this is the image that the whole thing returns. We can already see there's a whole bunch of data quality issue already, right? So there are some images that are not simply doctors. And uh, probably more seriously, you also start to see the bias inside this data set. So here there's a very obvious gender bias in what's being returned as an image. So those data quality issues are actually causing model quality issues. And you can actually see many of those issues in today's open model. And look into the future if you want to scale up the data set by another 10 times, right? We cannot simply collect more and more data and just push them into our model. We are kind of in a desperate need to actually derive this high quality core of our data to push into our model what is actually important and clean and also provide this rigorous control of our data quality. So our research essentially is centered on these two bottlenecks uh, we try to understand, okay, if we want to do machine learning at today's scale, how can we make them uh, as cheap as possible? Uh, and second, how can we prepare for a future where both the data and the compute are going to be scaled up by another 10 times? So we like to think about research as centered around this triangle. Essentially, the whole thing starts from the data side. The data become larger, become more complex, the quality become lower, and the cost that you need to pay to acquire and clean your data also become higher. So as a consequence of that, you see the model become larger and become more complex, and the data and the model come together as this pressure on your infrastructure. You have this huge requirement of flops and on your storage and memory. And as a reaction to that, the infrastructure start to uh, evolve in two different ways. They start to specialize, and second, it starts to scale up. So essentially, we try to break this triangle in two different ways. The first way is by looking at the data and realize, yeah, actually not all data are equally influential. Some are important, some are not important, and some are simply noise, right? If you only have a unit amount of computation that you can throw in, you should focus that computation on what actually matters. If you have a unit of effort to do data cleaning and acquisition, you should also focus your effort on what's actually important. So what we realized over the years is that data efficiency can actually be improved really significantly. Often you are able to have a model uh, that's better, but trained over fewer amount of data or fewer amount of clean operations over the data. And the second way of breaking this triangle is to try to get rid of the communication and the IO bottlenecks, right? We can compress them as much as possible. And what we realized over the years is the communication efficiency of today's training algorithm can really be improved without hurting the model quality too much. And what that can actually enable is training those big models over slow network. So today I will focus on the second part. It's pretty much about uh, training a model in a decentralized way or distributed way over a very slow network. But again, do not forget about the data side. Right? 
So why do we care about communication and the data movement, right? So we care about them because they are really the key bottlenecks in scaling up distributed learning system today. So let's just try to get the same page about what we are talking about here. So yeah, so here's a neural network. I have a whole bunch of layers and I have a loss layer in the end. So whenever you have a sample over your training site, so there are two things you can do over these neural networks, right? The first one is you can do a forward pass, right? Compute the loss. And second, you can do a backward pass and compute the gradient. When you have a huge amount of data, you can actually do data parallel uh, kind of partition, right? So of your problem, you can actually have, for example, this one mini batch, right? Decomposed into, for example, two micro batches. And sometimes the model is too big, you need to put them into different machines, right? For example, here we have four different machines, uh, have two uh, data parallel kind of pipelines, right? And then we cut each pipeline kind of like, like that is one cut. So if you look at this and uh, what's going to happen is there are three different communication channels. You have the forward activation, right? Every single time you do a forward pass, you need to actually pass on the like information, right? From machine one to machine two, you have the backward gradient whenever you are doing the backward pass. And of course, you have the data parallel communication to exchange the model gradient. So what we learned over the years is that all the three communication channels that you see in the slides can actually be compressed really aggressively without hurting the model quality. And sometimes you can even compress them by up to, for example, like 200 times. So let's go through some of the, the technical results and then I will show you uh, about what we are actually building, uh, which actually makes us really, really excited. So on the algorithm side, the problem that we are trying to deal with uh, is actually looks very, very, very simple. Essentially, this is the optimization problem that we are like trying to solve, right? So here you are taking the expectation and over your data set, right? If you are doing image net, right? So that's 1.3 million images. If you are doing GPT-3, right? That's 300 billion tokens. It could be pretty big. So the management of data is actually non-trivial, but mathematically it is what it is. So the X part uh, is your model, right? I mean, depending on what model you are trying to train, it could be two gigabyte or could be 300 gigabytes, so on and so forth. And the computation of the F function, right? Which is a whole neural network uh, is also non-trivial, right? If you are doing a GPT-3 175 billion model, you are talking about, we need essentially almost half a teraflops to just process essentially one token, right, during training. So this is a problem that we are actually dealing with. So the traditional way of dealing with that is by doing data parallel stochastic gradient descent. It's actually a pretty simple algorithm, right? So essentially, every single worker keep running essentially this full length of code, right? Every single one will just synchronize their model. Everyone have a model derivative, they will synchronize their model. They sample uh, local data. They compute the gradient and then they update the model. You keep doing this again and again, you get a neural network in the end. And this is a communication pattern for this baseline algorithm, right? As you can see, every single machine will do the local processing and logically they communicate uh, with a central server. And sometimes that central server doesn't exist. You can do all reduce among all of this, right? But logically, if you look at the flow of information, it's actually come from all of those, machi uh, all of those machines being aggregated and being pushed back. So theoretically, right, so for a non convex smooth function, you get the convergence rate that look like this, where T is the number of iterations you are going to run, N is the number of machines, and the system profile looks like this. You have this computation phase, and then followed by the communication phase, and then you compute again, right? So this communication phase and the slow network is actually what we want to get rid of. But this can be optimized. When you kind of derive new algorithm to optimize this, the game that we are actually trying to play is we want to keep the convergence as similar as possible, but on the other hand, make the system as fast as possible. So there are actually a lot of things uh, that you can do, but the, the, the whole optimization that you can do actually fit into the three different dimensions. The first one is you can actually relax this synchronization primitive. Instead of doing a full average, you can do something that's more relaxed than that. You can relax the data movement, compress the, like the, like the precision to only send a low precision representation. You can also relax the randomness you are requiring 
for each machine to sample the data. So what that we realized over the years is you can actually relax all the three dim uh, like dimensions uh, like all together. So I'm going to show you some of the example. For example, like you can actually uh, relax this kind of like precision of data movement, right? You can send a low precision retention of the data, right? So mathematically, it's actually introduced a very small term like in the convergence, right? So, but on the other hand, you can actually decrease this requirement on bandwidth really significantly. Uh, you can do asynchronous average, right? Instead of each machine waiting for each other, they work on a kind of slightly staled version of the model, right? They can keep doing computation. On the other hand, you have this parallel run that doing the communication, right? Again, it's going to introduce a very slight penalty in the convergence and often empirically, you won't really see that at all. You can also really like this topology of communication algorithm where uh, each machine actually do not talk to all the other machines form this Gaussian. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> about that. Yeah, so yeah, so I think this is where I get cut off. Yeah, yeah, I, I think so. Uh, look at yep. it. Okay, great, great, yeah. Okay, perfect, yeah. So, okay, great. <laughs> okay, so like we're talking about, yeah, there are so many different ways you can actually like your communication, right? So another thing that you can do in addition to quantize your communication and doing asynchronous communication is you can have this like decentralized topology of communication, right? So instead of half all the machines talking to all of like each other, like at every single round, what you can do is you form this decentralized topology and your machine only talk to their neighbor, right? So here, right, you actually introduce a very small penalty in the convergence. So the row here is actually a network constant. The, the, the denser your communication topology is, uh, the smaller the penalty will actually become. So there are actually a lot of things uh, that you can do here. You can also combine each of these fundamental, uh, fundamental building block. So we wrote a very small book about it. And if you're interested, you can actually read more detail here. But what got us really excited recently is we start to realize all those building blocks uh, that the community have been building over the years can actually be put together, right, to form a single algorithm that do even better. So this is actually one algorithm that we are doing now, training actually many models are together. Uh, essentially, the way to think about it is you have so many different machines. They, each one of them hold a partition of your data. And what they do is they keep doing these local iterations as if all the other machines do not exist at all. Right? They keep doing that. But of course, we need to communicate. So when should we communicate? The way that we think about communication is we have this communication uh, slot, right? Which is when all the machines are doing the next iteration, right? The network is free. And then we try to fill as much as communication as possible into that slot and come up with some global state called delta t at time t, and then just accumulate them to the local model. So high level idea is that as long as your communication fully overlap, within this communication slot, you'll be fine, right? So you will not see any slowdown caused by communication because I can fully hide communication behind the computation. So only thing is, okay, how can we design this global state that's delta t? So high level idea is you can actually use a mixture of communication uh, compression techniques here. So if, if you look at delta t, one thing is that, okay, it's actually have one step stillness already, right? Because it's actually doing that like in parallel of your computation, and you just accumulate that to the next step, you have one step asynchrony just associated with delta t already. And one thing you can do is you can actually randomly pick like p percent of the parameter to communicate. Uh, and for those uh, selected parameters, you can do a top k compression to just only keep the top k biggest value, and then you do a quantization of those values. And then you communicate this low precision representation. If you look at the end-to-end -end coherence rate here, it is actually the multiplication of all those three technology combined all together. And what makes us really excited is that these different communication compression techniques actually complement each other and compose really, really well. Empirically, if you want, for example, 200 times of communication compression, right? Um, like what you can do is you can put 10 times into local training, five times into top K, four times into quantization. This will actually give you something go all the way from 100 gigabits network in the data center to 500 megabits. That's what 200 times compression can actually give you. 
if you can do this, you can actually do data parallel training over one gigabit network without seeing too much slowdown end to end compared with the data center side. And in practice, it actually works very well. So these are the like, two six billion models fine tuning on different data set. So as you can see, even though we are compressing the communication by 200 times, this algorithm that we currently call Cocktail SG as a code name, uh, actually converge almost exactly with the radios, which without any compression. And if you put this 200 times onto a single uh, technique, for example, you put 200 times onto local SGD, put 200 times only to top K, you are going to see that they will actually converge slightly worse compared with the already strategy. So combining those uh, techniques all together can actually give you something that works better than every single of those techniques. So that makes us really, really excited. So this is about data parallel. You can do a lot of things about data parallel training. And also for model parallel training, uh, there are also things that you can do. So mathematically, right, the thing that you are trying to do right now is instead of looking at f as a function as a whole, we need to partition the f function, right, and put them onto different devices. For example, here we are cutting the model into two different cuts. We put f on one machine, g on another machine. Once you do that, you start to have additional channel of communication. And that's actually not a trivial amount of communication. For GPT-3 model, 175 billion, we are talking about for every single 1,000 token, that cut is going to introduce 24 megabyte of communication. So we have to do something about it. It's actually not that easy to do. So to be honest, we don't know the perfect answer for this, but there are actually some progress that you are able to make. So one thing is, if you are training your neural network or your data set, and you are doing multiple epochs, so instead of just directly compressing the compression, which could cause problems, as we will see, the thing you can do is to look at the same example across multiple epochs. And here we are seeing these two examples twice during training. And I'm going to do essentially two forward paths. The first forward path is on model uh, of version one. The second is on a different model. The hello idea is that if you look at the difference of activation across epochs, this should actually diminish. The more you train, the smaller this difference would become. And then the thing you can do is instead of compressing the activation directly, you can actually quantize the difference of activation of the same example across multiple epochs. This actually gives you something that have very interesting theoretical behavior that can going to give you that even though you have a biased compression of your activation, if you compress the difference, and if you have a high enough precision of the compression, you are going to have an unbiased behavior of the convergence. That actually makes us really excited. And the intuition behind the algorithm is actually not that hard to understand. Essentially, the more you train, you converge better, you start to sta like stabilize. And once you stabilize, your change of the model across epoch will be smaller. And then the change of activation will also be smaller. And then your quantization error will decrease even with the same amount of bit because the vector you are trying to compress now have a smaller norm. As long as your uh, like, uh, like compression ratio is high enough to close this loop, you are fine. You are going to have an unbiased behavior in the end. And all these things combined give you this end-to-end -end compression thing that you can do. Uh, looking back at our example, they cut more than different pieces, right? Uh, you can actually uh, use the delta compression to compress the forward activation, uh, you can use the mixture of compression technique we talk about to compress the model gradient. And then you can use another unbiased compressor to compress the backward gradient that you have. So once you do this, you can actually get something works really well. So this is with three bit forward, six bit backward, and four bit data parallel gradient. So as you can see, even though we are compressing the whole thing really aggressively, we are actually have almost the same behavior as a full precision version. So the orange curve is where you compress your forward activation in a direct way without compressing the difference. As you can see with the same compression ratio, it performs slightly worse compared to the full, uh, compared to the full precision setting. On the system side, what this enables is you start to have something that can do decentralized training. On. So here, as you can see, right, if we measure the throughput, even though our network is at 300 megabits, which is like 30 times slower 
than the data center scientist and here is like 10 gigabits, right? You are only incurring almost like only like 1.5 times slowdown compared with the data center setting. So that makes us really, really excited because it means that you actually do not need a really super fast interconnection between those machines to actually make progress on training. And uh, so for the last part of my talk, I will talk a little bit about the thing called together that we are building inspired by the result that we am talking about, but also inspired by so many different efforts by the community doing similar things. And the high level intuition is that we all complain we don't have compute. But if you think about it, we actually have computes. They are just scattered around the world. Looking at how much computation you need for a GPT-3 1.3 billion model, right? It, it, it looks like a lot of compute until you realize 20 years ago for the city at home project, we are able to harvest a similar amount of computes all by volunteers. And the only purpose here is let's try to find an alien together, right? If this number is not impressive enough, don't forget that was a time when computer looked like this. And for bigger models, you need more compute. But on the other hand, if you look at this amazing volunteer project called Folding at Home, right? Last year, when people are trying to combat COVID, they actually was like, like the biggest supercomputer in the world. It could have the enough amount of compute in floating point operations to train the biggest GPU models maybe in less than two days. So essentially, I would argue as a community, we are not really like our computes. I would go slightly even stronger to say, we even had some incentive design that actually successfully for people to contribute computes. What we need to do the same thing for machine learning is actually try to move from this data center environment where all the machines are being connected by super fast connections into this decentralized environment where machines are connected by 1,000 times slower communication. There are multiple challenges here. Right? The first challenge is how can we close this 1,000 times communication gap? And the second is how can we deal with the heterogeneity of devices and networks? And from what I talk about today, we are actually very optimistic that we can actually do something about that together with the scientific community. So we have start our journey here and do a little bit of experiment. So a couple of months ago, we trained a model called GPT-JT, essentially try to do a data parallel training over one gigabit network. So the idea is very simple. We essentially take all the great work the community have been doing. We take a lot of data sources that's open. Thanks everyone for that. And then we take a standard GPTJ model that's also a public open model and plug in this uh, communication efficient data parallel training algorithm. So we train the whole thing over one gigabit network, four way data parallel, and each machine has two A100 GPU. We only have 30% end to end overhead compared with the data center network, which is 100 gigabits. But on the other hand, we actually have a model that performs rather well on some of the tasks. This model actually performs very well on classification. This is called on raft in Helm, right? So essentially you can see, even though the model is only six billion parameters, it's actually outperformed many other bigger models because it was fine-tuned over a whole bunch of open data sources. So this makes us really, really excited because even with a very slow network, we should be able to make progress to make open model better. Imagine what would happen if we push in 100 times more data and 100 times more compute. I think we are going to have a much better model owned by the community. So again, this is just the beginning. Please give us feedback. The model is open. It's on hugging phase, right? So uh, please play with it and actually give us feedback. So another thing that we have been building uh, is actually uh, something called, we call research computer, try to connect in idle computes uh, across uh, academic institutions. Right. So right now we have uh, four different uh, partners here. Right. We essentially try to harvest computation here when no one is using them. Right. So as you can see, even before the the I clear deadline, right, which is actually is somewhere in the in the graph, right, you actually have quite some computes, right, in those institutions who are actually not being used. With all those idle compute, we actually run all the open model in the home uh, like benchmark. Right, how is the, like, like essentially how is more than 60,000 GPU hours run more than one, like more than 11 billion tokens over 10 open models. So this is actually just the beginning of our journey on together uh, the computer and hopefully together with the community, 
uh, we can actually connect all of our compute and also train the best model together. Yeah, thanks everyone. Yeah. Thanks a lot. So thanks for the great talk. And uh, I want to remind folks uh, who are listening to the talk and in the class to send in questions. Um, I believe, Michael, there's also a Discord, right? So uh, perhaps, you know, you can also um, ask questions from that and then um, in the YouTube chat as well. Um, so maybe I can kick things off and then we can uh, go to audience questions, I guess. One of the things I'm curious about is um, um, just the software that, that is available to support this type of um, you know, training and, and how you think about that. Um, you know, I assume you're you're building, you know, a good software to be able to actually uh, run training for large models on uh, this type of heterogeneous compute. So I'm just curious, you know, uh, what the state of that is going to look like over the next uh, year or two um, and, yeah. and what you're working on there. Yeah. Yeah. So I think, uh, so the infrastructure software in, in the decentralized setting, definitely not as mature as the centralized setting, right? But, but there are start to have progress. So that multiple projects are, uh, developed by the community we are actually very excited about, right? So there's a, one project called Verona, right? So they start to train this whole thing on small instance. I think the code is available from Microsoft. There's a project uh, called Petals, right? So training transform at home from Hagen phase, right? So, and then they start to build up this decentralized framework. So uh, together we are also building uh, something along the line, right? Try to deal with fault tolerance, deal with heterogeneity, deal with even though like how can we communicate when all those machines are behind the firewall, right? So I think together with the community, we start to build up this basic infrastructure for decentralized uh, communication and also the decentralized computation over that. So I think in the next year or two, I'm very optimistic you are going to see more and more mature software artifact. Uh, that allow you to do decentralized learning over kind of geo distributed devices. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. Yeah, it'd be nice to yeah. get like a, you know, a Slurm or Kubernetes style experience. Oh, yeah, exactly, exactly. So, like, our long term thing is like, like, like if you are using tools like a PyTorch Lightning, right? So, all you need to do maybe is just like say, okay, this is the entry to the decentralized network. Yeah. Right? Train it. Yeah. Right? yeah. So, I, I, I don't think we are that far away from that being a reality. Yeah. Awesome. And how do you think about like people buying into this, like, um, you know, like um, compared to using standard cloud providers and data centers, like, um, you know, how will people opt into providing their compute and how do you kind of imagine people participating to actually take advantage of the compute? Um, like, do you have, you know, open research credits and stuff like that in case people yeah. who are listening want to use some of this compute at some point? Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's an incentive question, which we are still in the process of figuring it out. Right. So, uh, so like, of course, like there are mechanisms, right? So, for example, a uh, free review, like, like support open research, right? So, I can imagine uh, there could be a, like the research credit for like for for researchers to actually uh being able to train the model, right? We can also turn some of the compute from the community and contribute them back, right? To actually train a really big model owned by the community together. Right. We can also have maybe more commercial tiers. Right. So like, I think all of them are actually possible. Yeah. Uh, it's not really clear uh, what is the right incentive uh, for the whole network to actually run. So that's mm -hmm. also something we start to kind of think about carefully and also asking feedback from both the research community. We are, we are, we are right now start to try to grow this research computer, right. Try to look yeah. in more and more institutions. Right. So ask their feedback, right. Like, how can we help you, right? So that's the first thing that we're really curious about, right? Like how can we help, right? Yeah. And second, how can we have your infrastructure and not only help you, but also help others? So hopefully we can actually figure out this incentive step, right, of building up this network. Uh, really excited to learn during the process, what would be the right incentive for the network to actually for some bootstrap and to grow and to maintain itself, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, I'm going to throw it over to Michael to see if there are, uh, you know, any questions and um... Cool, cool. Yeah, uh, so lots of actually great questions from CS324. Uh, so one question I had, or I guess the students had was on this notion of sort of incentives. Um, you talk a lot about like sort of like decentralized uh, compute. Um, I guess there's also this question of sort of like, you're not just providing sort of compute through sort of like these uh, different open nodes, but also like potential places for people to sort of like share their data as well. Yeah. I'm curious if you've thought about that angle and sort of like how does sort of like together compute, how does that integrate with sort of like ideas like federated learning? Um, 
does like sort of like having more access to sort of like people sharing data like potentially lead to issues with, for example, data bias where um, more volume leads to sort of like, I don't know, more data bias in some sense, like the average case. Um, yeah. 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 So, yeah. So, um, yeah. Let me, let me, let me, let me, let me answer that question more from the academic front. So mm -hmm. essentially, I think uh, if you look at those open models, right, so they are really driven by, by the data. So once we learn from the GPT, uh, like JT exper like, uh, like experience is the power of data. It's just fascinating, right? So here we are only trained the whole thing on like 3 billion tokens and suddenly this model can do classification really well, right? So I think this data consortium uh, by people contributing the data, like what those like lion fox were doing, right? So we are doing amazing work, right? Like, like how people contribute the data is a very important part uh, of the ecosystem, right? So, so here, like, like right now, we're actually working with Lion to understand actually how can we connect this community effort of collecting data with this community effort of providing compute, right? So I think this connection is definitely important. Once we have the data that's not open, it comes a question about security and privacy, right? So there are all those fascinating research about federal learning start to come in, right? So right now, I think we are, the, the way I think about it, uh, is we are building this fundamental infrastructure that people can plug in their data and also plug in their federal learning kind of algorithm, plug in security and privacy guarantees. And then we try to orchestrate in a way uh, that satisfies those guarantees. So, 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 so that's how I see what we are building, which is this fundamental building block for decentralized learning. So that's how at least I am thinking about this at this moment, yeah. Okay, cool, very cool, thank you. Um, <clears throat> Also curious uh, with respect to sort of like people buying in, right? Um, it's like currently how well does a framework work with, uh, I guess like uh, any type of compute, right? So sort of like an idle IoT device or someone's like cell phone. Um, is there a lower limit to how small these participating machines can be? And how do you reconcile sort of like different machines having uh, perhaps vastly different hardware? Yeah, yeah. So that's a that's a good question. So I'm 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 the short answer is we don't know how far we can push for. So like we know there are device, I mean, we know there are heterogeneity we are able to handle. For example, for different, uh, like right now, like a video GPU card, uh, that's something we know we can do, right? So the way that we are thinking about it in our scheduler is to kind of decompose them into smaller, what we call unit, right? So like for us, one unit is a one gigabyte, for example, like GPU memory and uh, 10 teraflops, right? So that's one unit. And then we have this, and virtualize the wrong word, but we kind of logically decompose a single physical device into multiple units, right? And put them into, into, like, into the system to actually optimize in a, holistic, uh, in a holistic way. So that we know we are able to handle, right? So, I mean, that's what we know. What we are confident that we are able to do is for a more diverse collection of GPUs, right? AMD card and, uh, and uh, like a media card, like, like even the, like, uh, like, like the chip you have on your MacBook, we are kind of optimistic that we should be able to have this unified both system framework and also the algorithm framework to actually think about them. How far we can push for that? Uh, personally, I'm not sure at this moment, right? So and it also depends on what the model you want to train is like how low that device can be. Uh, so we don't know where's the limitation, right? But that's definitely something we are actually pushing for at this moment, yeah. So we are kind of optimistic we can be pretty heterogeneous what is the lower bound of device that we can make use of that I'm not sure. Yeah. You see, okay, cool, thank you. Um, I guess a kind of related question is uh, sort of how do you do with the issue of like sort of these participating devices just going off? For example, like Dan's laptop earlier. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so fault tolerance uh, is, uh, is actually a very interesting question. So one thing that we are currently doing, for example, if you go back to this algorithm, uh, imagine one of the machines that goes down. Uh, well, I mean, to be honest, in many cases, if one machine goes down, yeah, it's not a big deal. All the other machines just uh, continue, <laughs> right? So in this case, you can even prove that uh, it won't cause a serious problem here. Uh, so there are some natural fault tolerance that kind of big, like start to bake into the algorithm, right? So. But you can actually do better, right? For example, if what if like 50% of machine goes down, right? So here you need to do a little bit of things about checkpointing, right? Periodically, all those machines just checkpoint 
uh, essentially like a like the state, like into a kind of secondary storage, for example. And then uh, when more machine comes up, they can actually pick up the job, right? So I think there need to be fault tolerance both on the algorithm side and also on the system side. But uh, personally, I feel the machine learning workload actually make the fault tolerance problem easier, not harder, right? So that's probably the good news for us. Yeah. Um, thanks. Um, okay, so this is a, perhaps this question is a little bit further out there, but I'm curious, like, do you have thoughts on how sort of decentralized compute might ma actually make it harder to regulate AI and if this is a good or a bad, like sort of decentralized compute is a good or bad thing for AI regulation. Um, because I guess now, for example, like a soda model will not be concentrated in a single server, perhaps like it's harder to shut it down in some sense, it's problematic, things like that. Yeah, yeah, so I think, I, think, I think that's a very good question. And that's something that we have been thinking a lot. And uh, at this moment, I feel like, like yeah, yeah, personally as a professor, right? So I feel like all the tools, every, like every single tool we have, have could have social impact and the, and, the, and the risk. And we need to be careful about all of them, right? So for decentralized AI, uh, once the like, computation is being decentralized, I personally do think we need to be careful about the regulation, right? So to make sure it's not being abused, to make sure we have a way to actually check the data, uh, like in a way that uh, like people are not like uh, like yeah to make sure like uh, like whatever being trained over the network uh, is up to the regulation uh, and also to make sure uh, we can protect privacy of the data or right, security of the data. So I think all of them should be baked into this design of the decentralized network. So that's my personal belief. Yeah. So I do think there need to be careful regulation. Uh, yeah, so 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 that's at least my thinking at this moment. It definitely needed. It. It's really hard for me to predict for the future what could be the potential risk that people are going to do, like do on this. I'm sure there will be some of them, right? But right now it's a little bit hard for me to certainly predict the future what about what it would be. But I think we should all just keep in mind that this thing could have risk, and when we are building it. We need to be responsible, thinking about the risk, and try our best to actually control the risk. Yeah. So, 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 and that's my current thinking of of this. Yeah. Got it. <clears throat> awesome. Thanks, sir. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Th thanks for that question, Michael. I, I think it's a you know really interesting question, and of of course, thanks to the to the students who who first um, asked it. Um, I'm seeing a, a couple of questions in the YouTube chat and also from the, um, from the, from the students on the, on the discord. A couple of people are wondering kind of, what do you think about sort of the alignment problem? Um, uh, another way that this is can, can be phrased is that we've heard a lot about kind of these scaling laws and you need your data is this big. So your model is this big. So you need your data to be this big. How do you think kind of all those things play, play out with, as you improve the data quality, as you kind of figure out better how to align models to kind of what you want to do, where do you kind of see the future of it going? Do you think we're going to be in this, you know, kind of this exponential power loss scaling forever, or do you kind of see uh, things changing a little bit? Yeah. Personally, I feel that once we, okay, okay, okay. So pretty much feel once we introduce a careful notion of data quality to really filter all the things that we are really needing here, I think we can even see a better scaling law, right? So that is maybe we don't need all data we are putting in the system today to train those model. Or maybe we can have a much smaller model with a fewer amount of data, but because the quality of data is high, you can do the same thing as if you have a much, bet uh, much better model trained over a much bigger data set. So personally, I'm very optimistic that once you have the high quality call, it should allow you to have a smaller model that do much better. So that's my personal belief. I'm, I'm very, very optimistic that we haven't fully unleashed the potential of our current data set yet, right? So even if you take the current data set and just shrink it down, I, I personally believe you should be something better. 
And the second, I think was really exciting is how can we make this alignment problem a generic framework, right? In the sense that everyone can actually put into their utility, put into what they want. And we have this automatic framework to figure out the specific data value, data influence, data impact that can help that goal, right? So I think Percy have this amazing work about influence function, right? So we have been doing a little bit about data valuation, the sharply value type of things. James also have a very fascinating paper there. So I think all of those understanding of data influence could actually help this alignment problem. I'm actually very excited to see this general framework that everyone can plug in what they want and they get their slice of data that is best for their task. I, I'm actually very excited and optimistic that these two could happen. Yeah. So that's my current feeling about yeah. this. It's very exciting, especially when you think about kind of that decentralized vision where everybody gets to kind of participate in yeah. the in the training and the, you know, you you, you get to actually um do these. Uh, Percy, I, I think you're on the call. I wonder if uh, if if you're available. If um, I know you and so could could talk about kind of the together vision and and all of this um, all day, but kind of what do you guys see as um, kind of the the vision for this going forward when everybody can kind of contribute to compute contribute to the research computer to the together computer? How do you think that changes kind of the dynamics of who gets to use these models and and play with these models um, in in the future? Yeah, I mean, I think I second everything that uh, Sir was saying. I think it's uh, data, compute, and code in some sense are the three ingredients of making AI possible. And already there is uh, these three elements come from different parties. And I think part of the vision is that they could be, um, you know, people should you know deserve credit and get, um, for the, their kind of contributions, and there should be some sort of more community uh, governance for determining how these things should be, you know, put together. So, so I think the whole idea of having a community-based um, approach to building these um, foundation models, I think, is um, you know critical for the health of the ecosystem. Yeah, great. Um, so we are reaching uh, 4.30, so uh, at the end of the hour. So I just want to say uh, thank you again to everybody who watched on YouTube, um, all, all the students in the Discord. Uh, apologies for my, uh, you know, internet connections, uh, you know, hopefully next time with a more resilient network. Um, uh, apparently, you know, a, a live stream with a single point of failure is not as resilient as deep network training. Um, but, uh, you, you know, we, we, we made it through. Um, uh, yeah, so thank, thank you everyone for listening. So you can go see this full schedule for this quarter either at the CS324 website or at mlsys.stanford.edu. There you can sign up for our email list and get notified who our speaker is every week. Um, I think we send out most two emails a week, so, so you don't have to worry about spam. Um, next week, uh, we're very excited to be uh, welcoming uh, Akanksha Chowdhury. Um, so she is the lead behind Palm. Um, which is, uh, you know, a, a a very big language model. I'm very excited to 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 get to talk to her. Um, and until then, uh, good, goodbye to everyone on YouTube.